recording. And I think we have it going. Yeah, so the recording is starting and it's one o'clock. So again, I'd like to say hi everybody and welcome to our Ask NCAR program. My name is Tim Barnes and I'm a science educator at the National Center for Atmospheric Research, NCAR in Boulder. I'm with my colleague, Carl Drews, who's a software engineer and of course we're each in our own homes, just like you are, but we're still doing our work and we want to share it with you. Each week, we will meet with someone who works at NCAR, learn about what they do in their jobs and answer questions from those of you who are joining us. And I'll be, uh, we'll be watching the chat, so if you have questions there, um, we'll, we'll, be, we'll bring those questions up. And also, I will ask that when you join, please do mute your microphone. And I have the capacity to mute your microphone along the way. So if you notice that all of a sudden it's changed, that's just me. Um, maybe some of you have already sent in questions ahead of time, but I don't see, I didn't get any copies of questions ahead of time. Uh, but that's okay. Feel free to write questions in the chat box at any time. And again, I said, uh, I'll be monitoring them. And we'll get to them during the question breaks or at the very end. So if you don't get an answer straight away, don't worry, there'll be breaks and then we'll spend a whole bunch, uh, we'll spend enough time at the end answering the questions. And one cool, one really cool part about working at a place like NCAR is that there are so many different types of jobs, such as being a scientist, an engineer, an electrician, a computer program, a programmer, a safety expert or a machinist, all these different jobs and more help support our scientific research. And with that said, now I'm going to turn it over to Carl, who's going to tell you more about what he does and take your questions. Carl. Hi, my name is Carl Drews. I'm a software engineer at NCAR, and I make pictures out of numbers. And I'll tell you how I do that. So I will begin by just saying that I work in an atmospheric chemistry laboratory. We also do observations and modeling. And today we're gonna to talk about ozone. So I'm gonna share my screen and explain what ozone is. Ozone is a gas, it's mostly invisible, but there are a couple of places where ozone is really important for us, and I'll show you what those are. Here is a picture of ozone in the atmosphere. In this blue layer up here, you see all the uh, sunlight coming down, that's mostly blocked by the ozone layer. So that's really good for us. But down here, you see down below, you see all this brown smog between the mountains and the factories. <coughs> that's ozone that's bad for us. That's surface level ozone. So we're gonna talk about both of those and we will see, and um, we'll fly through both of these and see what they look like. Now, since the one thing about ozone is that ozone is invisible, you can't, see ozone. You can smell it. So how do we know it's there? How do we measure it? Well, we have devices like this one here. This is used for carbon monoxide, but these are instruments that measure ozone and other chemicals. I work with some very smart people and we make a bunch of these devices and we put them on airplanes, we put them on towers, we put them on trucks and things, and they measure ozone and they give us a lot of numbers. So let's take a look at what those numbers look like. There, look at all those ozone numbers. See over here it says O3, that's ozone. And then this is the science we're looking at. Isn't this great? Isn't this wonderful? <laughs> well, of course, this is a long way from wonderful because there's all these numbers here and you can tell that some are different from others and bigger and smaller but it's really hard to figure out what these numbers all mean. So that's my job. I make a picture out of all these numbers. Wow. So let's look at one of the pictures that I made. Switch here. Here is a picture of those numbers. So this is a moving picture. Instead of numbers here, there's some numbers on this, but mostly it's colors. And you can see things going swirling around 
And I'll explain what this is. This is a look at the Antarctic, the South Pole. And what we're looking at is ozone. The ozone hole is in the middle and all these swirling gases going around and around and around are outside the ozone hole. But in the middle, it's all green there. That's the hole. So all these numbers, we can make a picture of them. This is especially interesting here because the one on the left was from the summer of 2018. The one on the right is a year later. And you can see that they're different. The one on the left is kind of well behaved. It sort of stays as a whole. The one on the right kind of goes smeary all over the place and the hole breaks up and you can't really tell what's going on over there. This is very interesting and this was discovered last summer and scientists are looking at this and trying to figure out why. In one case, the hole was really intact. In the other case, it sort of broke up and spilled out all over the place. So this is something we look at and this is kind of the way we want to set things up so that you can look at pictures and figure out what they mean rather than all these numbers. So that's what we're after here. Let's see, are there any questions? I'm gonna to switch to another display, but are there any questions right now for me? Uh, I don't see any questions yet in our chat, so I think, I think we can keep going for now. All right. One of the neat things that I do in my job is I get to take a bunch of numbers which don't seem to mean much, and then when I make a picture out of them, suddenly meaning jumps forth, and somebody comes over and says, look at that, look at that, look at that. And we both get excited over this, and we really like to see these things because we suddenly see what happens and the patterns and the flow and the swirling of the ozone around and around. So this is a really neat thing to do. I have a degree in electrical engineering for computer science. I have a master's degree in atmospheric science, so I can understand what the science is about. So let's take a look at another display of ozone. So what we see here is a map again, but this time it's over Colorado. And all those green and red and a few yellow squares are somewhere where ozone appeared above Colorado. This is surface ozone, not up high. So remember, this is the one that's bad for us. And we're gonna look at these here. This was a couple days in August last year when there was a lot of ozone produced by industrial processes like factories and like people um, driving their cars, a lot of things like that. So let's look at a movie here of what happened over Colorado. Right. Oops, hang on. Didn't quite get that right. Let's try it again. All right, now we see the movie. So you see ozone coming up in various places, mostly over the front range where I live, between Denver and Boulder and Cheyenne. So this is the plumes of ozone that I talked about. And let's zoom in a little bit so we can see this. And the different colors of the Legos. So these, so why are there all these blocks here? Tim mentioned the Legos. When I put all the numbers into the computer, the computer works as if it were a checkerboard. So there's a lot of these squares and there's checkerboards on top of each other and that's how the computer works and makes these pictures out of these numbers. Ah. So there you can show it billowing up. Now I want to show you just a bunch of different views of this. So instead of just standing off here, and just watching things happen. I've arranged for us to fly around Colorado and look at this. So here we go. We're going to fly around while this whole thing is taking place in front of us. Here we go. Back in. I think he just came back on. Oh, good. I'm back again. What Hi, happens Carl. is. <laughs> Hi. When you run a powerful computer like that, sometimes it takes away space from Zoom and so it doesn't work as well, but here I am back again. And so we're going to take a look at that just in a still here. All right. Can you stop it? So, it takes away from space for let's see. Zoom. All right.
we flew around the um, Colorado looking at the ozone coming off of it. Now I'm going to show something else and this will hopefully be a little easier. So um, let, me, let me first move a few things in place. There. I'm going to move around to the front of Denver here. This is the Boulder Denver area and you can see Colorado there. There's the plume that you see over the Boulder Denver area. Now I had a couple of inspirations for how to set this up. One of them was if you've seen the movie Tangled, that's the movie Punzel, um, is kidnapped and every year on her, she has real long hair, and every year on her birthday, they send a bunch of sky lanterns up in the air. So I looked at these things in the movie and said, that looks a lot like a plume of smoke coming up. Maybe I can do something like sky lanterns. My second inspiration was Minecraft. And Minecraft is a game that my kids play, and so they look at this, and everything in the earth on Minecraft, everything in your universe there, is made of these little squares. So I so thought maybe I could show the atmosphere that way. So when you're making something like this, there's a lot of sources of inspiration. And so these are the kind of things that you like to be able to see in front of you and, and look at and, and show what people would like to see and understand about them. Let's see on the movie again here. Off our flight and just run this animation. Here we go. There it is, building up over Boulder again, the Denver area. There it is. Now I'm going to show you something interesting that happened in the beginning here. There you can see the green starts and the red, so the ozone gets stronger. Like we mentioned earlier, the red is a stronger concentration. So the next day begins here. And for some reason, there is this ozone wall around Denver. Why is there ozone around Denver but not over Denver? Well, I don't know. This is one of the mysteries and I can ask some of the smart people that I work with in my laboratory and maybe they have an idea, but these are the kind of things that you look at a visualization. You try to figure this out. You don't know and maybe somebody listening to this broadcast will figure this out someday. It really right, does um, look like a wall. That really looks like a wall of ozone. Yeah, I just discovered this. This happens on August 20th at 23 and uh, this is something to figure out. You see new problems like this. Now I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and switch to the other one and we'll hopefully not overload my computer this time. So any, any questions come up? Um, not, it, not yet, yeah, we're still doing quite well. Okay. Well done. <laughs> okay, all right, that's good. Ozone is three if you've heard of that, and it's harmful to breathing. It has a smell to it, but it's most useful for, um, for us for protection from the o at, in the ozone layer from harmful ultraviolet light. You'd get very bad sunburns if we didn't have an ozone layer, and that's why the ozone hole is very concerning. So Carl, actually we do have a question about the, uh, the, the last visualization we saw, and okay. someone's wondering if maybe the the samples from around Denver were missing that day. Was, was there no data over Denver that day? That, that's a good um, idea to um, look at. And so, so something like that is exactly the kind of question you want to ask. I have found that when I move the animation forward by one hour or back, or it fills in. So only during that hour was there a problem or, or was there a missing ozone? Was there a hole 
right there. Generally, um, if I see something a, a successive hour and then go back to it, I know that that hour is working. That cell is turned on and that Lego brick is gonna show up when it's needed. All right. So let's go on to the third demonstration here. Just wait till it loads on my computer there. I think that's a good time to share my screen again. Here we go. Okay. Now what we see is the planet Earth. And it kind of looks like it's wearing a big multi-beanie, right? <laughs> that is the ozone layer over the Arctic Ocean, over the North Pole. You can see over here that there's kind of a gap and that's exactly the hole we're talking about. That is the hole over the island of Greenland and perhaps a little bit near that. And that is what, what we're, the, the hole that we're looking at here. This is everything that was ever showed ozone over a period of 10 days. So I'm going to show you this movie again. And you'll be able to see the whole change here, okay. See, it moves around, kind of swirls around and things. You can see that it's definitely above the Earth's surface. That's what's protecting us. Or if you're in Northern Greenland, it's not protecting you. So we could actually go down and look at some of this area close up. There it is. So I'm going to try this. I'm gonna try flying around the North Pole again. This time, hopefully we won't lose the connection because this one is a simpler, a simpler demonstration than the last one, all right? Iceland, I'm gonna fly up in the air, fly around the North Pole, and now we're above the ozone hole there. You can see the pieces of it. Again, I've constructed my ozone layer from these things kind of like Lego bricks, and they're all stacked together side by side and, and top to bottom. You see it changing as we fly around. I'm going to fly down and land in Iceland again. There. So, so Carl, it looks like we were, we were seeing a, a hole in that ozone layer. What, what causes a hole in the ozone? And why does it change? Tim, I don't know. <laughs> this new discovery, this is, these results are really hot out of the lab oh. and uh, people are looking at this right now and wondering that exact question. So a bunch of smart people have some ideas, but I hope that they'll be helped by visualizations like this one in order to find the answers. But I don't know, there has long been a hole over Antarctica and it's getting smaller, but this one is fairly new and fairly big and a bunch of people are wondering why that's there. And the hole over Antarctica, is that due to greenhouse gases or something else? That hole is due to something that comes out of spray cans called uh, CFCs, or a big word, chlorofluorocarbons. And that's a chemical that is used in spray cans, and it goes up into the air and it breaks down the ozone. Now, if we could keep that down close to the ground level to break down the bad ozone, we'd be really happy. But it's going up, way up in the air, and breaking down the good ozone. So that's why, that's what we need to take action against. So I'm gonna show the, I'm gonna take the flight one more time here. And uh, we did have a question on how many holes 
are there in the ozone layer? I guess that would be how many in Antarctica and how many in the Arctic? Generally, there's one over each pole. And I showed you them at the South Pole, and this is the one over the North Pole. There are momentary gaps in ozone elsewhere, but they're just real short term. And generally, the big, long ones, longer lasting ones, are over the poles, because that's where it gets really cold. And that's part of the formation of ozone, is the temperatures. Mm -hmm. Okay. A little virtual flight today. Yeah. Flew off from Reykjavik there. And that's what we were looking at. So another thing I've always liked to do is look at maps. I love to see these places and travel to them someday. And now I get to show these maps and show some interesting science on the same at the same time. So is that kind of what got you interested in working on this kind of stuff? This is uh, something I've always want, uh, loved to be able to do is to take, kind of take numbers and make a story out of them. And so the, they, the story ends with a beautiful picture like this, which hopefully has kind of pleasing and looks, looks nice and also has a lot of scientific interest. So from getting to something like a bunch of numbers on a page to something like this, this is my job and I love my job. I have a lot of fun doing things like this, and it's quite useful for other people. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh my goodness, you've, you've motivated one of our viewers. Is, uh, I feel like a giant brain <laughs> with all this information. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so we, we did have one more question referring back to the, our, our first demo. Is it okay yep. if we go back there now? Um, yeah, let me do that. Okay. And the question was about the accuracy lately of the MoCast. Do you know anything about the MoCast, Carl? I do know about the MoCast. The MoCast is a weather forecast made by a guy named Morris, who sits about 100 feet away from me. Ah. And the MoCast, the MoCast is really good. And he predicted this snowfall, predicted it would snow all day, and he said it would start at 9 o'clock. I think where I was, it was about 8.30, and that's pretty good. That's about the most accurate you can expect. Okay, so it's pretty accurate right now. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. Awesome. Yeah. All right. So, yeah, so I always trust the MoCast, and generally he apologized for having the snow, but uh, that's the way it goes. All right. <laughs> Well, it looks like we have about four minutes left. We'll mm -hmm. hang on for any other questions, questions that might come up. Okay, greenhouse gases from Greenland. They're, so they're both referring to the color green. A greenhouse is something you, are, you make in order to keep it warm in the, in the middle of the winter so you can grow plants and they're green. Uh, Greenland, yes, it's named because the Vikings who settled it and explored it wanted to convince everybody to come. And who would want to be on Iceland? It's all cold there. Let's go to Greenland where it's all wonderful. Well, that was sort of some a sales job. And right now, <laughs> Iceland is fairly green and kind of grayish color. Greenland is mostly white, as you saw from flying over it. Okay, here's a question. What is one cool thing you didn't think you were going to find out about doing these computer models? Well, one was I didn't really expect to find a wall of ozone around Denver. What is that? I don't even know what that is. A couple other things. I didn't expect the plumes to be so dramatic coming off of Boulder in the Denver area. They sort of go up and then they float out toward the Northeast. And so I certainly didn't expect. So every now and then when I find, I, I do one of these visualizations, I go down to the scientists downstairs or I go to Mike or Simone or um, Becky or Eric, and I say, can you explain these results? And sometimes they have an easy explanation, but more often they don't. And they look at it and say, we'll have to get back to you. And then they figure out something. So they're always thinking about this and they appreciate being able to see what their models are doing. Let's see, another question from Quinn. Where do you get your ozone data from? Are there sensors all over the world? 
Yes, there are sensors, a little bit more sophisticated than this one here, which is just for a house. There is also satellites. Satellites can see ozone. And so they orbit the Earth and they look at the Earth and find out where there's areas of high ozone, low ozone. And of course, they orbit over the poles, so they make sure they can look at that very interesting area. So, for example, now everybody has to stay home, which is fine because it's snowing out there and I don't want to go outside. The satellites, of course, are still working and they send information to computers and we log into the computers and look the information. But we are missing some data. There is a couple of, there are a couple of measuring stations up in Rocky Mountain National Park and up on Niwot Ridge and those have to be um, visited in person. And you're not allowed to go up in Rocky Mountain National Park right now because it's closed. And so they're missing data and they're really sad about this. But they will do the best they can with the satellite data and hopefully be able to um, start this up soon and be able to snowshoe in now and resume the data collection. So most of the data is still being collected. We're missing some sites. And we've got just one more minute here. See if we can get any last questions in. All right. So every now and then, uh, there are frustrations with my job. For example, when I think I'm going to show this beautiful picture and all I get is a blank screen or it's all black or something like that. And I have, that's a little frustrating. And sometimes I feel like I'm beating my head against the wall. But more often, if I take a walk and think about things and talk to somebody else, I can break through the problem and find out how I can get a real image and not just sort of a blank screen. So there's a few frustrating parts, but I really do have a cool job and I really do like showing things like this. Well, it's been really fun to explore the job of Carl today. Thanks for uh, telling us more bit about your work and thanks to everybody for joining us. We, let's see, <laughs> let's see, we had a question that we, oh yeah. How do we rid uh, bad, how do we get rid of bad ozone, I think, and keep a good ozone to safe? One last question, go ahead. Okay, that's something we're discussing in the front range. Um, and so if it's windy, the bad ozone will blow away, but we can't always count on that. Probably the best thing is drive less and drive cleaner. So cars are always having their emission standards improved. And so that'll help quite a bit. There's also some talk about adjusting our schedule to the sunlight. So we have daylight savings time, should we not? The sunlight plays a role in producing and breaking down ozone. So that's another idea. So there's a couple ideas, but as you can see from last summer, we haven't quite gotten there yet. Okay, well, everyone, we are going to end there to keep us on schedule. And if you look in the chat, I've posted a couple of times the link to our air quality activities. And again, Carl, thanks for telling us about your work and thanks everybody for joining us. We do have an activity, uh, some Bubbles on Bottles activity tomorrow at 10 a.m. So uh, feel free to join us for then. And right now we're going to sign off. Bye-bye. <laughs>